I have no yeah, idea. So she, yeah, We're not starting quite yet, but uh, recording's on. to hear um, a talk from our speaker today, uh, Dr. Danielle Tolman ursik from Northwestern. Uh, we'll talk uh, about some of her research, but also about the field of biotechnology and, and um, engineering bio biological systems as well. So a quick um, introduction. Uh, Dr. Uh, Tolman ursik is involved in a range of organizations and, and directs a whole bunch of departments um, at Northwestern and outside, um, dabbling between uh, professional training, uh, also runs her own company, um, as a uh, biotech field, um, understanding, uh, directing professional organizations. Um, so it can speak to us about how biotech and bioengineering can have uh, a range of entry points, but also applications to um, our understanding of the world around us and how we interact with it, broadly speaking. Um, her research focuses on building biomolecular devices for a wide range of applications, including energy, materials, manufacturing, and medicine. She's particularly interested in engineering multi-protein complexes such as virus capsids and machines that transport proteins and small molecules across cellular membranes. So she's received cellular awards, um, or several awards, cellular awards, several awards for the work, including the Sierra Leadership Award, the NSF Career Award, and the Biochemical Engineering uh, Journal Young Investigator Award. Um, so we're excited to hear about her work and also highlight all the potential um, for the field of biotechnology and bioengineering moving into the future. So if everybody could please welcome. A lot of you are at the back, and my voice is recovering from a cold. So can you hear me, like, back row? OK, great. Whew. I'm trying. If I get quiet, start, like, <laughs> giving up sign. Uh, so thanks for having me. I'm really excited to tell you about some of the things that we've been doing, both in the field of uh, synthetic biology is how I frame it, but it's, broadly speaking, just engineering biology or, or biotechnology, um, how we're it, teaching that at Northwestern, um, how our field is growing it, and where it's kind of going. Um, but I feel like a lot of the time when you hear these talks, you don't actually hear about the person and the fact that, um, you know, you get 
you get to do what you want with your careers and you can kind of get into a lot of careers no matter what your your path is and there's a lot of serendipity so i wanted to share a little bit about my path so you can see that you know you'll you'll find your way whatever that is um and there's gonna be connections that you won't see until you look back at them okay so i uh grew up as an air force brat which means my father was in the air force and we moved around a lot every three to four years um, that is all the places I lived in the country in, in Alabama. Um, I wanted to be an architect and um, I'm not an architect now, but I could argue that I still build things just of a very different scale with different materials than an architect. Uh, but that got me interested enough in um, kind of understanding how things work math, science, all of those things at the basic level. And by the time I got to high school, I had a lot of really great mentors kind of pushing me to consider engineering, specifically civil engineering. And that led me to apply to Illinois Institute of Technology. So not so far down the block, basically here uh, in Chicago, um, where I ended up not doing civil engineering because I took physics and realized that I did not like it. And I was not <laughs> going to be a civil engineer nor an architect. Um, but I loved chemistry. And so I stuck with engineering and did chemical engineering, having no clue what chemical engineers really did, because that's not something you see a lot of the time in pop culture or anything like that. Um, I am a chemical engineer and I'm doing biology, right? So actually chemical engineers do a lot of things, um, but you, know, you, you, you learn. And I really love my degree now, but I wish we could inform more people about it earlier. Um, I, met my husband at IIT. Uh, he is a civil engineer. Actually, he loves physics, so we got the balance there. He hates chemistry. Um, we're good. Um, and, and then I really didn't know what I wanted to do next. Uh, I learned a lot about petroleum as a chemical engineer in my coursework. Um, and then I started interviewing with companies and everyone was wearing hard hats and boots and walking around really dirty factory sizing equipment. I was like, what, what are you doing to help people? And I know ultimately the goal there, like it's supplying energy, that's great. Uh, but I decided to move towards biology then, right? So this is at the, towards the end of my degree. And again, had great mentors saying, why don't you just consider graduate school so that you can learn the biology side? And so I went. That's when I learned that they pay you to go to graduate school in STEM. I didn't know that until I applied and got offers saying we will pay your tuition and pay your, you know, kind of living wage. It was at the time, <laughs> you're going to laugh. I got paid $11,000 a year, $11,000 a year in 2001. So there you go. So right, like this is interesting. It's good to know. And I wish more people had told me. Um, so I got my PhD from the University of Texas, also in chemical engineering, but in a lab that studied antibodies, immune systems, uh, protein folding sounds very biology. It was a chemical engineering professor that ran the lab, um, but he partnered with a chemist and we studied biology. So it becomes really interdisciplinary really quickly. Um, so from there, I still didn't really know what I wanted to do, <laughs> um, but I had another really great mentor there who said, you should consider teaching, which I enjoyed all along. I had enjoyed. Um, and so I decided to keep that door open and not go into industry quite yet. And I did a postdoc at UCSF. Um, in this new area. So my advisor for my PhD said, you should do something in biofuels or synthetic biology. I had never heard either term. I went and looked them up, not even with Google, because I don't think that was really a widely used search engine at the time. So probably excite.com or ask Jeeves or something. I looked up what they were. So that's, this is me telling you, like I learned the, the things I'm gonna present now kind of on the way. Didn't have a plan, master plan to be in this area. Um, but ended up working uh, in my postdoc in a lab that was working on biofuels and synthetic biology. I followed the advice and it served me well. I got to kind of be in on the ground floor of this really new way of looking at engineering biology. Um, and so then I started my faculty career at UC Berkeley. Um, they called me and asked me to apply um, when I was on the market because they had actually tried to hire my advisors, both of them. Um, and it all worked out. I was kind of in the right space at the right time. So some of this can be luck. Um, and I had two kids along the way. One ideally timed just a couple months before I started that faculty position. You can have kids anytime in case you're wondering. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 2016, I moved to Northwestern where 
they were uh, putting together a new center focus in engineering biology and we founded the Center for Synthetic Biology and um, I kind of jumped at the chance to join a group of really excited people in this field that I was part of um, all coming together and that's our original group there. A few have left and a lot more have joined. So that's kind of my path and um, I'm going to talk more about what it is that we do for the rest of the time but I wanted you to hear that you know don't feel like you have to have everything worked out, um, be open to possibilities, and hopefully, maybe some of the things I say will be among those possibilities for some of you. Okay, it's, okay there we go. So, today I'm gonna talk about what synthetic biology, engineering biology, biotechnology kind of is, and what I mean by that, how we do it at Northwestern, how it's um, being used in industry and in academia and the, the research labs, and then how you can get involved. Okay, so first the what. Uh, as I hope I don't have to convince anyone in here, biology is amazing, right? We, we have, with biology, you have lipids, nucleic acids, amino acids, and some metals and assorted other components, salts and things. Um, coming together along with the pretty clever universal-ish genetic code. And with that, we have things at the like subcellular, like molecular scale machines. They're just fascinating. Um, they have the ability to grow and divide, not only at the cellular level, but to form all sorts of different structures as we see in plants and all of our organs, right? This is amazing. If we could do this as engineers, if we could make something from those same simple building blocks, that would be incredible. Instead, um, the majority of our uh, past technologies have really built at macro scale level materials rather than these smaller ones, but I think this is really a, a goal where we could maybe use biology for our technology going forward. Um, we already do this a little bit. There are biofuels in most, um, most major petroleum companies use some biofuels uh, as part of their portfolio. So they're converting, whether it's plant residues or sugar cane or uh, algae, some sort of biological feedstock um, is now being used to, to make our fuel in part. Um, insulin has long been a uh, biotech advance, right? The ability to make some of the proteins that uh, the human body um, in some cases is lacking. Um, that is the very definition of biotechnology. And of course, all of our consumer products that you might use on a daily basis that have uh, biotechnology in them, including laundry detergents if they are those stain fighting and things like the, the cold water stain fighting. They had to especially engineer those stain fighting enzymes that are in the detergent to work under these cold temperatures. So um, uh, that's one example. So it's already there um, and this has been well established. These were kind of the earlier advances just uh, with recombinant DNA and kind of exploring around the field. So um, I would argue now though, we are on the cusp of a whole new revolution in engineering biology. Uh, and what I'm showing here are the, the ages. I'm only going back to the mechanical age. Obviously, we could go all the way back to the Stone Age if you really want to go. But lately, our technological ages have been coming in faster and faster waves, say decades at a time. Um, and most recently, we had that petrochemical age earlier in the 1900s. Um, and now the electronics or information age, which is letting us really begin to understand uh, the complexity of biology in a way that we haven't been able to before that's going to enable us to engineer it, hopefully, uh, and help solve societal challenges. Um, that can be in biomanufacturing, finding sustainable, sustainable ways to manufacture a lot of the things we're getting currently from petroleum or non-renewable resources. Um, there, there's a need and a huge opportunity in agriculture. So whether I'm talking about crops or um, food supply in terms of meat or protein and how we can maybe replace those uh, with bioengineered solutions. Uh, sustainability goes beyond manufacturing though. We can also use it to test and remediate our environment potentially by using what nature already has and just allowing it to work better in situ. And I, you know, medicine is, is going to be there. It's a big one. That's where we can have a, a lot of impact with personalized medicine. All right, so synthetic biology specifically, this very systematic approach that I'm going to tell you about is um, been noted by some visionaries as being one of the biggest innovations coming. Um, also recognized by um, the current uh, 
president and uh, executive office with a lot of push towards writing policy and funding in this space to make sure we stay on top of it as a country. Um, companies such as Ginkgo Bioworks, which was relatively recently valued in the billion dollar range um, that focus on engineering biology very systematically. And I'm throwing Northwestern up there because we think we're gonna help uh, kind of propel this field. Okay. Okay, so the opportunity, I just said everything is great. We have this data, we have um, opportunity, we're at the right time, right place, people are interested in it. So what is the real challenge? Why don't we already use biotechnology in place of some of the traditional less sustainable technologies? Um, basically the, the answer is cost and risk and speed. And if you wanna to add to that, policy hasn't caught up. There's a lot of other kind of associated societal challenges that'll have to be addressed. Um, shown here, you know, just looking at two different, two different forms of a single substance in a, a single organism, I could come up with maybe a hundred different, I feel like I'm too far from this, it's not going forward. Hundred different ways to depict all the different ways that biology is complex. Just looking at all of the different features in our guts is, is kind of my favorite one, all the, the different organisms that have to coexist and with us and with what we eat and so on. But even if you look in a cell, right, you have uh, RNA and protein and we always think of cells as this like jello that's got some stuff in it, but it's actually jam packed and everything in there matters and when it's there and how much is there and all of that is so tightly controlled and evolution did a wonderful job of getting us here. But then how do we perturb that without messing up other associated reactions. That is, is a really big challenge. So basically, we don't know everything yet. Cells are complicated. There's a lot of unforeseen consequences of any interference that we do. And on top of all of that, cells have evolved to grow and, and reproduce, right? Like survival is based on that. And so they're not always going to follow our instructions. They will kind of kick those out if needed to better survive. Okay, so how does that apply in, in the application space? It's actually really easy to see. I've got to back up to, to use the pointer here. Um, so one of the first biotech chemical products was this 1,3 propane dial. So there's a company at the time, it was um, maybe Tate and Lyle, Genencore, merging with DuPont, they all kind of worked, they, worked and acquired each other. So now I can't even remember the order. Um, they used E. coli to convert sugar to 1,3-propane dial, which we currently otherwise get from petroleum. And that's used as a, it's one of our top 20 commodity chemicals used to make a lot of other things, including like probably the carpets that are in this room, um, just as one example. And it took, for them to do that, it took 15 years, about 575, person years of work to get this one organism to make this one chemical that we wanted from one substrate, which is sugar, which may, may not really be the ideal substrate for a lot of things. Okay, so did we learn from that? A little bit. So then this company, Amaris, that came out of uh, UC Berkeley was trying to make artemisinin, which has some precursors that are also very, very useful in replacing petroleum products, by the way. Um, but it's an anti-malarial drug found a way to do it in E. coli, had to move that to yeast to make it commercially viable. A um, little bit faster, 13 years, a lot less people years. Unfortunately, they just filed for bankruptcy for restructuring, right? So even after having success in doing this, it's not always the whole answer, um, but they did leverage what they knew to make this other petroleum byproduct in a sustainable way. Um, and they did that much faster after making the antimalarial compound. So four years, but a lot more people years. Um, so we're getting better, but we're not to the point where we actually know what we're doing. That's what that's conveying. Okay, so what is the answer? How do we do this better or faster so that it's relevant and in, you know, my lifetime, hopefully your lifetime, uh, um, if not mine. But Okay, so at Northwestern, we've... We've been breaking biology down 
um, into scales. And I don't think this is a particularly um, new way of looking at sciences um, from engineering, but it's actually fairly new for looking at biology to engineer it, which is interesting because biologists have been studying the scales for a while, but from engineering standpoint, we hadn't done it this way. Um, so basically there's molecular level interactions. You want to study protein-protein interactions, binding, maybe enzyme chemistries. There's genetic circuits. So the networks, the regulation of everything. Um, how those run in one cell is not how they run in another cell, right? If you run these programs, you can't just move them across different organisms. It's not going to work. Um, and then how those organisms interact with one another. These are all different scales. And if we're going to engineer, for example, the production of a biochemical, it's not enough to know how to make that chemical with the enzymes. We have to make sure that we put them in a cell that can actually express and fold those in such a way that they're still functional at the right time so they don't kill the cell and can actually carry out that product. And we have to do it in a way that they can be fermented so that we can make a lot of it at the scale we need, right? Kind of going all the way up, I skipped a few steps there, but hopefully you get what I'm saying. Like, it's not just about any one scale. And it turns out most of the problems arise at the interfaces, and there's interfaces to all, through all of them. And so we've been trying to, um, to showcase that and get everybody thinking up front before they start maybe finding an enzyme that can do a particular biochemical conversion, making sure that they're going after the right challenge for whatever societal problem they want to solve. So let's take nitrogen fixation as an example. Um, if we want to understand the challenge here, uh, every living thing needs nitrogen. It's one of our, you know, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. We all, we all need those, maybe sulfur and phosphorus, right? It's, it's in amino acids and nucleic acids. <clears throat> Atmospheric nitrogen is very abundant. Unfortunately, it's also pretty inert to most biology. And so how do we get it? Um, there were a lot of agricultural practices. So plants are really great at um, this, but where do they get the nitrogen from? They actually get it from their soil microbes. Where do the soil microbes get it? They're the ones um, doing this fixation. So early agricultural practices actually made use of growing the plants that did the best job of recruiting the microbes that did that conversion. Not that they necessarily knew that's what they were doing, um, you know, in the, the uh, last millennia um, mm. when they were planting in this way, but they knew it gave them more successful crops and yields to plant certain crops together and to rotate in a certain way. And it was because of the soil microbiomes that were coming along. And then um, kind of skipping a lot of things. Then we started realizing we could use fertilizer in the form of bat guano and we're carting that in from different islands, right? There was all these things that happened. And then there was a call out to the chemist saying, look, we're gonna run out of bat guano for fertilizer and we're gonna have a food crisis in this world. And the Haber-Bosch process was invented. And that was great, supplied us with a lot of nitrogen by fixing it chemically. Um, but now so abundant, we apply it to crops to get the maximum yield everywhere and we ended up leading to other problems, uh, over fertilization, and it, it gets to our, especially our river deltas and things, and it's causing a huge crisis in those uh, ecosystems. And so what we would propose here is to maybe come up with a solution again, looking back to nature. How does nature fix nitrogen? Can we get plants uh, in an environment that allows them to uh, access the amount of nitrogen they need, but not too much, so we don't have all that runoff? Um, and, and how would we engineer a solution that looks like that? Well, first you got to understand at the cellular scale, it's the microbes that are doing most of the nitrogen fixation in our world. We got to go catalog all those, see which ones might be the best fit for different crops and um, soil uh, in, in the Midwest of the US is maybe in a different category than soils in say Israel or other places with a very different ecosystem, right? So which cells can do this? Um, and we got to figure out molecularly how nitrogen fixation occurs. It happens through an enzyme called nitrogenase that is put together with a really complicated regulation system that I'm not going to get into, but the network scale is really important here because the enzyme isn't just like one little soluble enzyme, it's a whole uh, mass production. Um, but then we got to get that cell that's going to be engineered to make this really complicated thing somehow. Um, maybe it already does it naturally, we've got to get it to survive again in that environment of the soil with all these other microbes and the plants and sense when the plant needs nitrogen and fix it then and maybe not at other times, right? So there's 
a ton of challenge here. And it really isn't necessarily just about understanding exactly how this enzyme works or exactly how the regulation works, but all of those things together, we need to learn it in certain contexts. And on top of all of that, we've got to figure out, especially that GMO question, right? Are people going to accept plants that were grown in soil that had a genetically modified microbiome? Or do we have to find natural ones and kind of encourage them to evolve in such a way that we help this process? Society might help dictate these sorts of things. So this is a really, um, I think, great example of how, um, how to think through this process in the way that we've been thinking about it um, from molecular all the way up to society and using that before you kind of dive in and solve problems. I could do the same thing in medicine with CAR T cells. Um, these are the chimeric antigen receptor T cells, the ones that are displaying um, um, different receptors that allow them to target specific cancer cells and, and destroy them. Um, but that also kind of comes up, yeah, through molecular interactions, you've got to have them targeting the right cancer cells. Um, but there's a lot of complex signaling that happens exactly with those receptors that leads to that. Um, the, the cells that you engineer have to be the right ones for each patient's body, um, and they have to survive in those bodies, and people have to be willing to take the drug. It has to work in each person. There are population level averages, but differences among people, and so where do we start looking to to engineer this, right? You gotta look at the scales and the interfaces. And I'm not gonna go through this whole one but uh, again, but artemisinin, making that antimalarial drug, almost anything you can kind of deconstruct here and start to realize where the, the biggest challenges might be. Um, and going forward, I just wanna point out, it's not limited to these um, uh, deep biology questions that I've been presenting. Um, in my world of chemical engineering, we also worry about scaling up whatever we do. And so, for example, biomanufacturing of the COVID vaccine starts with engineering DNA from which they then later make the RNA that's going to go into the vaccine. So you got to engineer that, but then you got to figure out how to make it at a larger scale and, and go up even higher to ferment it in a bioreactor. And then you also got to worry about how to purify it. Um, and then, again, administer doses. And are you making something that people can tolerate? Um, is there regulation for it? Is the policy right? Are people going to accept it? We've all seen that play out over the past few years. So everything I said is not really limited to the biological questions, but also the kind of the engineering questions of how do you actually make it after you've gone through the biology. Um, and so at Northwestern, we've been developing curriculum that covers this. We have a class introducing engineering biology called um, Principles of Synthetic Biology. We have a class on deconstructing it, learning how to view each potential um, application space you want to go after and figure out where the challenges are at each scale, highlight which ones might be the biggest ones to solve first. Um, and then we have classes in, right now I think we have all of the scales except for communities already created and, and underway. We've been creating these over the past five years or so. And so we've rolled out around one new course per year um, and we have almost all of them. And so that has led us to create some, um, uh, a new minor in synthetic biology and a certificate in synthetic biology um, for the masters and PhD levels. We're still working on getting that down to the undergraduate level. Um, but it also led us all, as we were developing this curriculum, that group of us that formed the center when I moved there, um, plus all the ones that kind of got added in, we, we talked to each other and we started working together and we have uh, kind of research proof with a lot of stories that I could discuss here and don't have time, storing data in DNA form, um, looking at how you can use good bacteria, um, uh, lack of certain features that are in pathogens to find antibiotics that only target pathogens and leave the good ones alone uh, when treating uh, an infection. How you can use, again, nucleic acid-based sensors to deploy uh, water diagnostics. And that one's a really interesting one. My colleague, Julius Lux, is, um, just got a few million dollars from a grant to look at deploying lead biosensors that work within a half an hour, like a COVID test, that um, are going to be deployed across the city of Chicago, but with community leaders and groups to inform what to do with the results, right? So there's this huge societal component, and so it's a really large study to kind of look at not only what happens when we have this technology, like what do people do, but also how can we start writing policy right away to help them use that information, right? Um, 
we had COVID um, treatments get developed. And also we turned a lot of our attention towards um, how we can turn waste into new products. So we solve two challenges with one, one solution, right? We get sustainability and we stop um, releasing so much waste, carbon dioxide um, and, and other waste. Okay, so that was a little bit of an overview of how I'm Okay, 15 more minutes, we're good. So I wanted to touch on where this goes to in the real world because um, I think it's, it's a nice academic exercise to say this is important, um, but where is biotechnology being used in the world? Um, first, it happens at scale when we're talking about supplying things to the world. It's happening in these bioreactors. It's very much a chemical engineering problem. Um, biology is very much a part of chemical engineering and um, you, you can go into that area with a biology background. Um, I just know you'll interface with those that have learned a lot about oil, but it really applies here to biology too. Um, fermentation is all done in reactors, just like brewing beer, we brew the, the enzymes. Um, to help us make important medicines and also all those chemicals. How many of you have heard of Lanzatech? One person, which is Michelle, by the way, Michelle's also um, <laughs> from Northwestern with me. She's my colleague. Um, and either of us is gonna be happy to talk to all of you afterwards. Um, she's led a, a site visit there for some of our students. And um, so Lanzatech is headquartered in Skokie, Illinois, right? right? down the street from you all. And this is a company that was actually founded in New Zealand, uh, interestingly enough, but they moved here uh, to do this work. And um, they found a bacteria in the gut of a rabbit. Um, it's a clostridial um, bacteria. So you know, maybe clostridium is famous in, in other species for other things, but they found a clostridium that uh, makes ethanol from carbon dioxide as its primary function in the rabbit gut. And they were able to engineer this, figure out how to grow it in those large reactors at scale and use it to eat the carbon dioxide that was the waste effluent from, from factories um, in Asia and also from burning landfill waste in Japan, um, making when you, when you burn something, you get CO2 and CO and, and water, right? Um, and so they fed those products into these reactors that had these organisms, these clostridia species, to make... Fuel. So they made ethanol at first, but now they're actually engineering the organism to make other building blocks that currently come from petroleum. And the idea is to reach a circular economy where everything they make gets converted back in the CO2 and CO that they can feed to their organism. So it's truly recyclable all the way around. Um, and they have many factories now all over the world taking in this waste carbon. They do everything. Um, they do life cycle analysis and techno-economic analysis to make sure it's actually going to be a net positive for the planet when they do it. And um, they just went public last year, I believe. Um, maybe it's two years ago now. Um, lots of hiring going on, if you're interested in that. Um, we work closely with them uh, as, as researchers at Northwestern. So that's one example of it in practice. Y'all have probably heard of Impossible Foods, though, yeah? Lots of tech, not so much, but Impossible Foods were there. Um, that's also biotechnology, right? It's making essentially heme so that the, the fake meat tastes like real meat because it's that iron um, that we need. And, and that was done by overproducing um, a, a heme protein. Sorry, it's not going on. Um, there's another company that spun out of the lab that I did my postdoc in, actually, uh, in, in California, called Pivot Bio, where they, they use their knowledge of nitrogen fixation, that nitrogen fixation problem I mentioned earlier. Um, and what they're doing is finding uh, microbial consortia that are natural that they can put in crops and help increase yields already. So kind of the thing I was explaining to you, they are putting into practice um, at Pivot Bio and they're beta testing across the Corn Belt right now. Um, and they, they have a lot of momentum behind them. So maybe some of those answers are already here. Um, you can also use biotech to make materials in a sustainable way, especially mushrooms and fungus is a huge new uh, area of exploration. How can we use these to make food and materials? I've been up showing materials here. Um, bio leather, again, often from um, mushrooms, but also you could do it from collagen as this company Modern Meadows set out to do. Um, and you can make other materials too. You're not limited to things like leather. You can make silk. 
um, and that's one of Bolt Thread's products. Um, there are companies out there in our field that are, are definitely in the therapeutic space, and I'm highlighting one of probably 100, um, where they're engineering T cells, as I mentioned, to treat cancer. There are companies out there that are using this kind of biotechnology, these biosensors, the same kind that are essentially used to sense toxins in the water can also be used to personalize medicine um, in several different ways. You can also use CRISPR-based technology, um, company out of UC Berkeley. Um, and then there's a lot of companies out there right now that are just doing, um, doing something really needed, which is helping supply the reagents for our field. Like we need a lot of DNA to do all this research. And so there's a company that has figured out how to make DNA much, much cheaper than it used to be. And so it's so much cheaper to do this research. And that company is called Twist Bioscience. Um, there's platforms to help us design biology using a program a lot like AutoCAD, only for biology. Um, this is one example. There's actually several examples of that. Um, Teselogen is one of them. Okay, so giving you a flavor, that was a whirlwind tour, but the point is that this technology actually is out there and it's a place that you can go with the things that you're learning in the classroom right now. Um, all right, so what, what am I doing? I didn't actually talk about what I do yet. Um, and since, since I have all of like eight more minutes, I'm gonna use the time to talk a little bit about my favorite topic, um, which, is, which is really um, proteins, but we'll start with my motivation. Um, I, I told you that one of the big problems in biology is how complex it is. And when I say that, what I really mean is that biology is highly organized. There's so much going on, but it's all kind of a, a well-oiled machine. Everything is super regulated and tightly organized. And so that's both spatial and temporal. I'm primarily right now interested in the spatial organization questions because you just can't do it all, um, no matter how much you try. We know how much spatial organization matters in our lives. Right. Um, you, you have cities that are actually quite well planned, except when you disrupt them um, with, say, trying to rebuild the highway, it becomes really, really bad really quickly. Um, but I've been in other cities that are not so well designed, um, and even when everything is not under construction, they have worse problems than we do with traffic. Um, my house doesn't look like this. I used to have the picture of my house. It's so embarrassing, I took it out. Um, <laughs> this is an ideal like children's area. What do a real one look like? And there's toys everywhere, and you're going to step on a Lego and hurt yourself, no matter how much you try to keep them off the floor. And we have cubicles. I don't think a cubicle is the ideal office by any means, but we have these cubicles. Look how nice they have space to write. They have the computer underneath. They have the monitor on top. They have room to type. Um, when you look within the cubicle, that's a, a very functional setup that my personal desk may have a little bit more paper kind of cluttering it, and that's probably detracting from my efficiency, right? So we know it matters. We strive for that. Um, in biology, it also matters. Cells are organized. There's organelles. I'm going to show you there's even organelles in bacteria. How many of you learned that bacteria don't have organelles? Are we over that yet, or are we still learning that? Okay. Um, bacteria don't have many lipid-based organelles, but they have a ton of spatially organized organelles that are carrying out different functions, um, but you know, their eukaryotic counterparts are really well defined and, and well studied. Um, those cells come together to form tissues, to form organs, to form organisms, and those are all specialized pieces of the body, right? It's all spatially organized. And then in the ecosystem, you have these communities that arise, and each one is kind of integral, and they're all spatially organized doing their jobs. And so I think if we're really going to have a lot of impact on engineering biology, we're going to have to learn how to control the spatial organization, too. And a lot of the traditional engineering biology was more like, let's make this enzyme in this host. Let's just throw this piece of DNA in there. It's going to make it. It's going to be great. Yeah, but sometimes we throw all those pieces together and nothing happens. Why not? Right? It's because we weren't worrying about this. Um, so we need to control the movement across membranes, that's one way to control things. Um, and we need to control the cellular organization, the, the arrangement of all those enzymes on scaffolds or in organelles or within the communities of organisms in our final system. And so I study the 
types of proteins that sit in the membranes that control movement across. That's one of the things. And I study some of these um, structures that exist. They're superstructures. I study virus capsids because they're a really great analog for some of these protein-based compartments that a lot of microbes <laughs> have that help control their spatial organization. And virus capsids happen to be really easy to study. So we study both of them. But then it turns out viruses themselves are also really great at um, carrying out functions kind of in concert with us. Um, thinking about all the bacteriophage that are alive in your gut that are doing different jobs in, in our gut microbiomes and things like that. But that's a more recent approach. And so I'm application agnostic. These things matter for every application that I've talked about, including when I haven't. Um, if we're going to go into resource-limited environments, Mars is a really great example of one. But there are also developing countries that might be in the same boat where you don't have maybe a cold chain and so on. Um, so here's one example of the, the research we do. Um, bacteria, as I said, actually do have organelles. They often tend not to be surrounded in lipids, so not easy to see by microscopy <coughs> um, until we had TEM. Now we can see these. So these is it's kind of what it looks like inside. Um, this is salmonella. Um, e. coli has them. A lot of our like, lab organisms have them. Um, they look a lot like viruses, right? They're these polyhedra um, containers, and they are filled with enzymes, but very specific enzyme pathways. And in this particular case, in Salmonella, um, the, path, the, the compartment we study is called the propane dial utilization uh, micro compartment, so PDU. Do you remember propane dial was one of those first products that I said came from biotech? And um, so this might offer us a way to make propane dial from glycerol, which is a waste product that we'd like to better utilize, instead of glucose. Okay? Um, but it naturally actually exists to degrade propane dial. Why do salmonella want to degrade propane dial? Anyone know? I didn't know this until I started studying it. Um, when we eat food, one of the <coughs> biggest byproducts that most of our gut microbes don't eat is propane dial. The other one's ethanolamine. Salmonella has two compartments, one to eat propane dial, one to eat ethanolamine. What does that mean? When you eat that questionable hot dog at the gas station, um, that's a line from one of my grad students, I love it, um, and it gets in there, the salmonella don't have to outcompete the other organisms for their food supply, they just eat their trash. They are dumpster divers. And why don't all the other ones eat it? Because you have to make this super complicated machinery to surround that enzymatic process because the intermediate of that degradation is an aldehyde that's really toxic at the levels that you would need to survive. Or at least that's what we think. We've been studying it for, I just kind of gave you a synopsis of what we've learned over 15 years of studying this thing. And we're pretty sure that's what's going on there. So it builds this whole contraption to sequester away all the enzymes that carry out this biochemistry, um, this uh, basically the metabolism for the cell and, and give, give this central metabolism uh, propionyl CoA. That's what they turn it into. And so we're just going to co-opt that and get this compartment to actually make propane dial for us, basically kind of run it in reverse. And we can't do that currently in organisms because, same thing, intermediates are toxic, and so you can't actually get the organism to make it very efficiently. So if we sequester it away, maybe we can make it. Does this kind of make sense? So this is what we've been working on. Um, we spend a ton of time figuring out how enzymes get in there versus outside in the cytosol. Um, how do you change the number of them? Well, you know, how does the whole thing come together? How does it assemble? How can we perturb that? Um, and we actually have been um, working with Lanzatech on whether we can use these to make some of the chemicals they're interested in in the organism they're interested in. So kind of transferring it to organisms that are already used in biomanufacturing. That's one. Okay. Um, I mentioned those virus particles that we were originally using just to kind of figure out how to study those compartments. And then we learned how great they were on their own. So we study this MS2 bacteriophage. It's a bacterial virus that infects E. coli specifically, so it's a really great one to work with because E. coli can make grams of it um, per liter, so we get a ton of material to work with. And with this, we thought, okay, well, let's see how much we can perturb this structure here, this beautiful, um, I cut it open for the picture, um, but this beautiful icosahedron, T equals 3 icosahedron, made out of one protein that just kind of came together to form a soccer ball-like thing. Um, how much can we change it so that we can add a targeting ligand to get it to a cancer cell, so that we can get it to fall apart at the right pH when it enters the endolysosomal pathway? 
um, so that it can encapsulate cargo that we want on the inside instead of maybe its native genome. And that's not trivial. So you can make some changes and still get the assembly and you can make other changes and not. Um, and so we've been really systematic about exploring all the different ways we can change it. And now we're working with several companies who are really interested in applying that to, um, maybe this will be relevant, but um, even other potential virus scaffolds. How do we engineer them systematically so we don't lose the features we want and we can get rid of all the um, traditional duties of that, that particle? And so that is one. And then this last one is the one that led to the company that I am a co-founder of. I love salmonella. It is, it's a model <laughs> organism. It's easy to grow. It's just like E. in so many ways, but it lost the battle in the research labs. And, um, and it has this really cool machine that is the first step of infection. It, it kind of injects toxins into our cells. Um, and we are repurposing it to secrete protein just into the media in a, a biomanufacturing sense because it's really good at getting the protein out. And if you looked up how most proteins are made today, they're either made in fungal systems that, or yeast systems that already make a ton of a particular protein and they just use it. But if you want it to make something new, it's kind of hard to, to get it to make something new. Or they make it in E. coli, which is great at making something new, but it doesn't secrete it out. It's like making something in a factory that doesn't have a door. And they literally break open the building and then extract all the product. But of course, in the cell, our product of protein looks exactly like all the other protein in the cell. So there's a lot of, of uh, inefficiencies. And so like, let's use salmonella, which has this cool structure that only the bad E. coli have, um, but good salmonella have it still. That just secretes it out, puts the door in the factory and let the bacteria make it. And um, it didn't like to do it at first. We figured out a lot of things we had to engineer about the system. So this whole really tightly controlled 23 gene uh, complex and we figured out which ones we can change so that it makes a whole lot more protein go through this system actually only the one we want none of the toxins um, we make a, a lot more of these systems in the cell we think um, and so probably five technologies kind of wrapped together um, we now have a company that's out there trying to make proteins that are of interest to to our commercial partners um, who right now Maybe you've heard of the design explosion in protein space because of AlphaFold and all these AI tech. There's all these proteins people are designing and they want to see if they have the function that they want. And we have a, an organism where we can put it in a lot of 96 well plate wells and just uh, you know, see which ones have the function they actually intended with their design, that kind of thing. So that's one example of a way we could use it, but uh, we could also use it for a lot of other things that I am probably not supposed to talk about yet. Um, okay, so. I want to wrap up because I am yeah, a little bit past my desired time. Um, how do you get involved? This is the most important part. Um, first, we have an REU program in synthetic biology. I'm the director of it, so you can ask me any questions you want about it. The application's actually just closed on Monday, but you know, let me know if you're really interested and, and I can explain how to apply or maybe for next year we can talk. Um, we have, it's a 10-week program at Northwestern. There's a stipend, there's room, there's board. You're put together with other people that are interested in the area and y'all get mentored research in a lab, but also workshops about entrepreneurship, about how to communicate, how to network, um, how to um, design a, an experiment, all, all of the stuff, a boot camp on all the techniques that I didn't get to go into detail today. Um, okay, what else do we have? Masters in biotechnology program, which Michelle is also kind of here to represent. And um, so once you graduate, if you want to get into this field and you really didn't have the engineering background, this program exists as that bridge uh, to help train biologists who want to learn enough engineering to go out and work in all these companies that I mentioned and some of our employers that have hired our recent grads are shown here. Um, we have panels and site visits and a curriculum designed for people who were maybe engineers that didn't know biology to come learn the biology, but also biology who weren't necessarily engineers to learn the other side, kind of mixed together. Um, we also have opportunities for engineering management minors, um, entrepreneurship minors, that's in bio minor, nanobiotechnology minor, all sorts of other associated programs you could do um, while there. It's... Uh, 18 to 21 months long. And then if you're interested in a PhD, we have a ton of PhD programs that feed into our SynBio Center faculty research. And we also have an NSF funded training grant program along with a biotech 
um, training program funded by NIH and a few others. So there's lots of opportunities. You get a stipend just for coming, but you can also maybe get additional fellowships once you've arrived and you get to take part in some of the development of, of the field, um, which was how we created that curriculum that I had talked about early on. How many of you were really interested in medical school or a medical profession coming into biology? I'm just curious. Yeah, a lot. Okay. So this is my pitch. You could do that and you're going to like do amazing things helping, helping people and I want to do that too. But if you come into the research side, you know, this dark side, you could maybe develop a medicine that's used to treat millions, right? And so just consider the impact you might have on the other side too and whether you want to be more like interactive directly with the patients or one step removed, you know, interacting with patients in a, in a clinical research setting or two steps removed, like developing the drugs for them as you work with the clinicians who work with the, the patients. Um, and you can do a master's in less than two years. It costs a little bit of money, but you get paid a, a ton when, when you leave, not quite as much as if you do a PhD, but that takes longer, but you do get paid to do it, and your tuition is covered. Medical school, sometimes you can get the tuition covered, but usually not, and you almost never get a stipend, right? Just say, there's a, there's a huge <laughs> benefit for um, the either shorter program or, um, or the PhD where you're paid. Um, I also want to say for domestic students, um, we offer some nice scholarships usually at Northwestern, so um, don't look just at the sticker price. Um, there's, there's some good coverage there and there's some opportunities. Okay. Um, so that's it. I'll close here and I am happy. We love our purple. Um, I'm happy to take any questions about any aspect of that. So feel free to raise your hand and for folks that are on, on Zoom, if you want to type your question into the chat, um, I'd be happy to read it for you. Or if you'd like to ask it, we can attempt to facilitate that. But any questions in the room? Um, so I'm interested, it's a little bit different. I'm interested in um, like a neuroscience PhD, but I've always had like a love for, like a growing love for engineering. And so I was kind of wondering how is the program in terms of like its interconnectivity between uh, science departments and can you still do like a, a certification even if you're in a different like if I did a neuroscience PhD can I do a certification in a synthetic biology? Um, um, the answer to that question is definitely yes. Um, I don't know if we had anyone do it yet but um, as long as the program advisors don't mind your electives being in our, our area we don't yeah we don't have a, a barrier there. Um, how connected are they? Northwestern's pretty collaborative and so we know, um, we know a lot of people, even if they're not directly listed on our website. Um, the master in biotech program actually has the most connection with neuro. There are a lot of our students that will do neuro research early um, and then learning that engineering at the same time. And then they go to PhDs that are, are kind of purely neuro. Um, yeah, and about a third of our center faculty, I think, are downtown in the medical school. And neuro is also split, right? Like there's a, a, a Evanston and a, and a downtown contingent. So I guess some of the connectivity depends on which people you're talking about, which ones they're connected to in my center. Um, but yeah, it's so interdisciplinary and interconnected that the departments are bound for like the coursework, um, but there's a lot more fluid for the student. Thank you. I'm, I was really interested in that, so thank you for answering. Do you have a proudest career achievement, like in your research? Oh, in my research, that's a different. <laughs> <laughs> you can just do overall. So overall, honestly, it's the people. I I am in academia to like I, you can do science and mentoring in industry and. So it's not limited, but in academia, I get to work with people before they figured out what they want to do. And I'm kind of most proud of the people that came in with either no clue or really struggling and something I did or said or like supported them along the way through a hard time. And then to see them go out and like, you know, rise up in either industry or in, in a couple of cases, their faculty themselves now kind of doing the same. And you can like see it spread. Like this one person I helped is now helping hundreds of others. So that's honestly the thing I'm most proud of. Um, research specifically, um, I, I don't, 
I want to hold that. I want to see how this company thing works out. <laughs> so I, you know, we do all this research in the labs in academia, and we want people to use it. But it turns out it's really hard to bridge that gap and to have it actually get out there in the world. And so hopefully with the opera, um, people actually use the system that we've been engineering to do something good for the world. And if that works out, that'll be my most proud thing. And until then, I'll reserve it because maybe something else will kind of leapfrog and, and get right out there in the meantime with these companies we're working with on the other technology. I don't know. So, thank you. Um, there's, yeah. Um, for students interested in synthetic biology or, you know, the graduate school for bio, uh, bioengineering, like what qualities or background experience do you like look for in those things? Um, okay. So, Qualities is curiosity, um, just kind of having passion to do science and uh, have positive impact is a big one and to like be curious to talk with other people that have different backgrounds. Um, I get the question a lot like, well, how much biology do I need to know from the engineers? Like, do I need to know how to pipette already and coming on? No, I didn't know how to pipette when I went to grad school. I had never used a, a pipette or streaked a plate or grown anything biological when I went to grad school. It's not a requirement. But on the flip side, you don't need to know any engineering. You just have to be willing to ask questions of the people around you so that you can all work together. And so that, like, focus on being in a community of people that are working together and being willing to ask questions and, you know, fess up when you broke something or whatever, it is. like just being part of a team and like doing whatever you can to support the team is number one. But with that curiosity comes the best discoveries because if you talk to a lot of people, you get kind of the best ideas and you make the most progress. So by far my, my number one quality. Nice, good follow -up. Are you interested in also what makes a competitive application? Yeah, so competitive applications, there are at Northwestern some GPA limit, I don't even remember what it is, probably 3.0 or something to, to get in. Um, people that meet that bar, we are looking for um, in chemical engineering, they don't have to be chemical engineers, but they often are. Um, somebody that will be able to pass our classes. So pick the program where you're gonna be able to pass the classes. Um, you know, do well in them, enjoy them, all of that stuff. Um, and then we look for an understanding of what research is, like what you're getting into. Like there's a ton of failure. There's a lot of days that don't go well and it makes the ones where something works right, like really, really sweet. Um, so kind of conveying that you understand that there's gonna be ups and downs um, based on your past experience, that you're resilient and you can get through that usually makes a much more competitive application, that research statement and um, like personal statement is really important to demonstrate that. Uh, because otherwise people look great, they come in, they hit one failure and they're like, you know what, I'm out, I can go, you know, do something in the real world. And so, um, yeah, that beyond the, the obvious, like get as high of a score as you can and everything and apply to the program that's aligned with what you want to do, it, it's that resilience. But I look for the curiosity too, personally. So. There was- I had the same question. Oh, awesome. <laughs> same question. Great. I actually have another question. How, um, as you're thinking about exploring all these kind of groundbreaking technologies, so we study environmental contaminants, and a lot of them like we made, like we we produced it <coughs> right. as our role. Role purpose. Mm -hmm. How do you balance that? Um, yeah, I guess how do you how do you balance that? How do you balance like just kind of being curious and bold and make big moves with also a sense of caution yeah. at an individual level or a policy level? However, you want to answer that enormous question. Right. Actually, I think it's something that we weren't doing very well, and science became really siloed from society and also all of the other, like, on, on campuses, you have the sciences, and then you have the social sciences, and, and then you have the humanities, and we kind of don't have a lot of intercalation, right? Um, and I think one of the biggest things is, is to get scientists talking with the members of the community broadly and also the social scientists especially because they're really great at helping think through how things might impact but one of the things we did we had an artist at large who worked with our synthetic biology faculty so an artist came in and asked us questions and we asked him questions and it was amazing how much overlap there was and how he could provoke people to think about the questions that we were trying to answer and kind of get societal feedback because frankly every technology Every technology has downsides, right? And it's whether or not we see them in advance and start to mitigate that as we deploy them. Um, one example is um, 
I think it was from Super Freakonomics or Freakonomics, one of those, um, you know, there's pollution in the streets, our transportation sources are um, now consuming our food crops and it's a mess and there's traffic accidents and it's all terrible, there's gridlock and what can we do? And you know what the solution was for that was the car because they were talking about horses, right? Mm -hmm. And so the car came out and it was clean. There was no horse poop everywhere. And it was easier to control the machines eventually. And um, gridlock was actually alleviated because of how they designed the streets. Anyway, everything was solved for a little bit. And then we realized that we were causing more pollution and then we gave them higher and higher speeds and we had more deaths and all these things, right? So technology is always gonna lead to more problems. And so the more we think up front about it, the better. So in our center, we actually have uh, an anthropologist and we're trying to bring in other folks in policy and ethics and art to exactly help that because we are not good at communicating out. So we're trying to bring those people in to help us learn how to communicate with those communities. And I think it's really important. I'm glad you brought that up because I meant to talk about that. It's not been fun. Any other thoughts, questions? And I'm sure um, Dr. Tolman or Sick or Michelle would be happy to answer questions after this as well. Scott, I think up your swag if you've got them already. Yeah, and we'll swag donuts if there's any left and coffee. <laughs> okay, we'll say thanks one more time.